2 Timothy chapter 3 in the New Testament, towards the back. Towards the back, you're not going to have very much left in the book when you get there, okay? So it's back here somewhere. All right. It's in the T's. All the T's are together in the New Testament. You got 1st, 2nd Thessalonians, 1st, 2nd Timothy, and Titus. So look for those T books. You'll find it right there. This morning, I'm, I just want to go through this and let Paul's words, let the Holy Spirit speak through these words. I just have a few comments to say about them and a few things to kind of set tone and, and um, context for what's going on here. Jesus, our Lord, came and began a work in the church. He began the work when he first created mankind and the Lord said, let us make man in our image. And that work has continued since then that God has been fulfilling an eternal plan to make mankind look like himself. That's what the work of righteousness and salvation is, is that we are sinners, we are fallen, but through the gospel of Jesus Christ, God makes us holy, he makes us righteous, like himself, that God said, let us make man in our image. Let us make humankind to be like us. And as we know, the thing that stands between us and godliness is sin. It's wickedness, evil in our hearts, lusts, desire for evil things, the want to do bad things, the wickedness in mankind because of deceit, because of lies, This work continues. God is still doing the work of cleansing people, saving people. That's what we mean when we say we want them to be saved, is that we want God to do a work in their lives, to change their lives. You know, there are people around you that you might have in your own family, and you, you maybe thought to yourself as a Christian, you say, Lord, save that person. They don't know you. They don't believe in you. Will you save their soul? What you're, what you're asking God to do is to take them where they're at, And by his grace, change their life to make them more like him. To make them alive. To get them born again. This work continues. And church, as long as we're here in this world, this work is going to continue of God's salvation. God making people more like him. Raising them from the dead so they can live eternally. We're surrounded right now in this world by a lot of evil and a lot of sin and wickedness. And we know that to be true. All you got to do is turn on the news for five minutes and you can see more than five minutes worth is a little too much sometimes. Can we just be real honest about what's going on in the world? Now, I'm mentioning this because I have to make this point. When Paul is writing this letter and he speaks about evil men and he speaks about terrible times... He's not talking about evil men in the world. Let me show you what I mean. There in verse 1, it says, but mark this. I'm reading from the NIV. It says, but mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. The King James says perilous times. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Let me stop there. Now, isn't that an apt description about the way that the world acts? Lovers of themselves. I mean, we are living in the selfie era where we sell selfie sticks so you can take a picture of yourself and show everybody who you are and put, listen, I've taken selfies, okay? Don't feel bad and get all convicted because I'm talking about selfies right now, especially you young people. But you have to understand that this notion that you are the center of the universe is false. Right now, we live in a time with social media and the internet where everybody has an opinion. Everybody has a Facebook. Everybody has a Twitter. Everybody has a voice. And there's a lot of people saying nothing. (sighs) 
But I have to tell you, my friends, when Paul is telling Timothy this, he's not talking about the world. Because the world has always been selfish. The world has always been filled with greedy people. The world has always been filled with blasphemers. When Paul is telling this to Timothy, he's talking about the church. The people called out by God who are supposed to be holy and supposed to be righteous when he tells Timothy this, that in the last times, terrible times will come, that perilous times will be upon us. He's saying that those influences in the world are going to creep into the church. That in the church, there's going to be lovers of themselves. I find it interesting that right now, more than any time in history, there are more ministries right now named after one man than there's ever been. When the church is supposed to be the church of Jesus Christ, how many fill-in-the-blank ministries, pastor's name ministries, have you heard of? Where the pastor is the one that is the focus. The preacher, the evangelist, the prophet, the bishop, whatever. There's this selfishness of exalting the self because this guy is so smart. This guy's such a good talker. He, he gives me goosebumps when he preaches. We put his name on the sign outside. When it's supposed to be the church of Jesus Christ. And Jesus is supposed to be the center and the focus. Lovers of themselves, lovers of money. That's an easy one. You've seen it, I've seen it. I'm so glad that we operate in this church with an accountability that, uh, that a lot of churches are lacking. And I, I don't want us to boost our ego too much. You know, I don't want to do that. But I just want to say that having elders and deacons and having a treasurer who is not me actually protects me. I know, I know of many stories of preachers and pastors and churches who led their church. They were the elder. They were the deacon. They're the secretary. They're the one handling the money. And these men have fallen from grace because they've taken on the responsibility of, of things that they shouldn't be responsible for because they don't have the strength to fight that temptation. You've seen it in the news Pastors falling from grace because they stole money or embezzled thousands of dollars and, and offshore accounts and all kinds of terrible things. Listen, in the world, people are greedy. People are lovers of money in the world. People that don't know God, that have no godliness, that don't know the Lord, of course they love money. So why would Paul point it out? He's saying it would come into the church. And I could prove that he's saying it would come into the church. Go there in verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power. Paul's point is that there are people who have a garb, a clothing, a form, an outward appearance, a facade, a mask that they wear that appears godly. But its power doesn't change their life. Its power is not evident in the way that they live. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Listen to this. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to come to the acknowledgement of the truth. And I think about so many widows, widows' houses that were devoured by televangelists telling these people, talking to them on the phone, send me your money because I need to buy a jet. There's devils on the the commercial airlines, so, so I need a private jet so I can do the work of the Lord. And you have these widows sending all their substance, these weak willed women. And this idea of the weak willed women is not saying that that's something characteristic of the woman. It's this idea that she has no protection. That her husband's gone or there's, a family, there's family members that are not protecting her. So these kinds of people that have the form of godliness, they, they worm their way into these homes and steal all the money from these women in order to enrich themselves. We see it happening right now. Now listen, corrupt kings and corrupt princes in the world, corrupt governments have always stolen from the poor. 
Paul's not talking about that. He's talking about men in the church doing this. There in verse 8, it says, Just as Jannes and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men opposed the truth. Men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. Paul is saying that these men, if you examine their lives and examine their doctrine, they are heretics. They don't preach the truth. They preach the gospel for gain. They preach the gospel in order to get wealthy. But they will not get very far. Because as in, is in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. Have you ever listened to a tele, televangelist for like 20 seconds and then immediately knew, that dude, there's something wrong with that dude. Like, it just instantly you knew. It was clear to you that... Call right now, and I will give you a piece of cloth that we put olive oil on, and it's going to heal your cancer. I'm thinking to myself, wow, wow, that sounds amazing, like a miracle. Then he's like, just send in a donation of $29.95, and we'll send you two. Free shipping. <laughs> oh, Lord, help us. And here's the thing. I love Christian TV. I want more and more preachers to be on TV so they can share the gospel worldwide. But what I keep seeing is that these na these, this nation, in this nation, these networks are filling the airwaves with a bunch of hucksters, snake oil salesmen. Lord, help us. Help us. Verse 10, listen to this. Paul takes a change of tone. He says, you, however, know all about my teaching, my way of life, my purpose, faith, patience, love, endurance, persecutions, sufferings, what kind of things happened to me in, in Antioch, Iconium, and Lystra, the persecutions I endured, yet the Lord rescued me from all of them. In fact, Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. I remember when there was a fight for free speech in this country back when I was a teenager and I was a young man. And these black and white stickers began to get slapped on all the music in stores. Parental advisory, explicit lyrics. And on one side, you had a fight, a fight for art, which is a good fight, a fight for people to be able to express themselves truly. But on another side, you also had people that said, this nation and its children will be corrupted and encouraged to do evil if this kind of music that glorifies evil things is allowed to be sold in stores. Now, this is just my opinion. But where I think we went wrong was that we drew a line and we divided ourselves as a people instead of coming together in unity for a solution. On one side, people said that they were fighting for their right to free speech and to say horrible things over the airwaves and in their music, glorifying evil works, denigrating women, talking badly about neighbors, glorifying, glorifying shooting up your neighborhood, glorifying devil worship, and a lot of the heavy metal and black metal the subject matter is evil and wickedness. Now, I'm a guy that loves metal and hard rock. I love good music. There's a lot of evil messages out there in the music. And when people stood up to say, these are evil things that are being taught to our children, 
those people were ridiculed and persecuted, saying that they were enemies of freedom of speech because they didn't like the lyrics of someone's song. Well, if you don't like it, don't listen to it. If you don't like it, don't listen to it. And I agree with that. If you don't like something, don't listen to it. But that doesn't get to the heart of the matter. That doesn't fix the problem. And from that, this is just one thing in our culture, from that, people who glorified evil and sin became wealthy and influential. Young people go crazy when they see them and want to take their pictures with people who spread nonsense. And right now, I know right now, there are a lot of people that are going to look at me like, wow, you're just ignorant, you're closed-minded. I know, I got some young friends that look at me like, Richard, I thought you were cool, man. I thought you were cool. Listen, I'm going to be cool, cool basking in the shade and the refuge of the Lord my God for an eternity. And there's going to be a lot of people who have spread teachings of devils who are going to be sweating and find no relief in eternal fire. That's the truth. That's the horrible truth of eternity. Is that people who spread lies and corrupt our young ones. Jesus said, if you cause my young ones to stumble, it'd be better for a millstone to be tied around your neck and you thrown into the deepest sea. And we were ridiculed because we wanted to protect our children. All who want to live godly in this present world will be persecuted, Paul says to Timothy. Now, I know that felt like a sidetrack, but you get my point. I want to protect free speech. I want to protect people's liberties. But my friends, as Christians, as American Christians, your liberty should not be used as a license to sin. Liberty and freedom has been given to us so we can be free to live righteously. Father, help us. Father, help us. There in verse, th- verse 13, it says, While evil men and imposters go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. He says that the godly will be persecuted and the evil men and the imposters will go on. They will continue in their work, going from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. And something that we don't want to face sometimes, I think, something that a lot of people stick their head in the sand about is that <sighs> there's this weird pie-in-the-sky gleam in our eye thinking that like everything's going to be all right, like things are going to get better. Listen, for you, believer, for you, in eternity, yes, things are going to get better. But as for this world... The scriptures make it clear this world is going to get worse and the only thing that's going to stop it is when Jesus come, Christ comes back and destroys it. Like we the church, we are actually the ones, we are a bulwark of righteousness holding back a flood of evil that will overtake this world. Do you know that? And some of us are starting to show our cracks. It's getting tiring holding up righteousness. It's, it's weary holding up righteousness in this world. It, it, it just, it breaks you down because it's wave after wave and it seems like it's accelerating. Do you remember when there used to be like a major countrywide, nationwide issue like every few years? Some of you older gray heads know what I'm talking about. It used to be we were dealing with this conflict at this time. There's a bunch of problems all at the same time. But it's like there's this major conflict. Everybody's talking about it for the summer of 72 or whatever it was. 
And then some reason, for some reason, somewhere in the 80s and the 90s and then on into the 2000s, it seemed like countrywide, nationwide issues started to ramp up. And now it's to the point every single day it's something different. I, even, I got Christian friends that, that they'll post on their social media and be like looking out the window like, what part of the book of Revelation are we in now? Like, what? is the devil doing now out there? People get mad at me. People get mad at me because I pointed out. People are going from bad to worse. They're going from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. I like trouble. My, my middle name is Danger. Um, I, it boggles my mind how on one hand, I was told straight to my face, it's like, well, you hate women. You're a chauvinist pig. Because I said that families need strong fathers in the household. That's what we're missing. And I was called a chauvinist pig for that. You don't care about women. And so I answered back, well, what women are you talking about? Women who were born as women? <laughs> like which women were oppressed? The ones born biologically as women or the ones that identify? Which women are you talking about? I thought gender was fluid to you guys. I, people get so angry with me about this. It's like, listen, I can go along with being merciful and compassionate and understanding that you do have things you're dealing with and you're trying to figure out the world and you're trying to figure out the truth. But don't tell me that I have to ignore the reality that I see right in front of me. And I get told by people, say, well, you shouldn't label people. Right after they just got done saying that I'm a bully, and that I'm a chauvinist. Well, you shouldn't label p people. You just called me a chauvinist. What are you talking about? You shouldn't label people. Lord, help me. The deception is getting worse and worse. Right now, our children are being taught in colleges and in their high schools that there's no such thing as absolute truth. We use phrases like this, that like, speak your truth. Listen, there is no your truth. There's your experience. There's your opinion. There's your life and the, the path that you've walked. But listen, the truth is the truth with or without you and your experience and opinion. The truth is eternal with or without you. I had a conversation with a young man who was struggling with homosexuality. This is back when I was a volunteer in Valley Center Christian Church. I was working with the youth, and basically I was just playing the drums and driving the van. I wasn't the youth pastor. I was just a volunteer. But we got into a discussion, and I asked this young man, and I know it wasn't my brilliance, it wasn't my genius that thought of this, but the question came to me, and I had to ask him, I said, why would you define yourself by something that's not eternal, that's not going to last forever? I told him, like, when you were born, you had no sexual desire when you were born. You spent the most part of the first years of your life as a child, as a baby, as a, as a young person, with no sexual desire, no sexual identity at all. You were just a person. And when you get old, when you get old, there's going to come a point where that's no longer an important thing to you anymore. Can I get a good amen? Listen, this is the reality. When you get old, sexual identity isn't going to matter to you because this thing is wasting away. It quits working. Like it literally quits working, this body. So 
that small part of your life experience, you didn't have it when you were first born, and you're going to lose it when you get old. Why would you put your whole identity into that? It's temporary. It's fleeting. It doesn't last. Why identify yourself by that? I had the opportunity to talk to him about Jesus. But having a real name, a real identity found in Christ that will last forever. Doing real ministry is dirty work. Like if you really are going to teach and preach and share the gospel and evangelize people who don't know the Lord, you're going to have to be prepared to talk about hard things. And you're going to have to be ready for people to hate you for it. Listen, I love my country, and I, I, I feel stupid that I have to preface this, but I get letters, I get emails, I get text messages and phone calls because of some of the statements that I make from Christians that will tell me how I was wrong. Let me preface this. I love my country. I love my freedoms. But let me tell you something. The Apostle Paul didn't need the Constitution to protect him when he preached the gospel. Well, Lord, thank you for the right to worship openly in this country. And I mean that. Thank you, Lord, that I have rights that are protected so that I can worship and preach the gospel openly. But I have a question for you. If those rights were taken away, would you stop preaching the gospel? See, if you need some rights and a government to protect your rights, Freedom in Christ, you're not a Christian like Paul was. I hate to say it, it hurts to say it. The men who wrote the Constitution, the men who stand up and serve the people of this country and fight for our freedoms, they realize the truth is that they're God given. They're not protected by some piece of paper. They're not protected by some legislation. It takes people with a heart for God and a love for their people to protect it. Paul's freedom of speech was protected by God Almighty. It cost him everything. This is hard for me. And there are some that think that I don't support this country or that I don't support the Constitution or something. It's like, I do. I support this country. I support the Constitution. But let me tell you, friends, the Constitution is not the Bible. The Bible's inspired by God. Listen, if the Constitution was inspired by God, why are there so many amendments to correct it? Let me say that again. An amendment, the, the word amendment itself implies that the thing that's being amended was imperfect, so we had to fix it. That's what an amendment is. You're adding on to to make it better. You don't have to do that with God's word. You don't have to do that with God's word. God's word even declares, don't you add to these words or I'll add the plagues that are in this book to your life. Don't you take away from these words or I'll take your name out of the Lamb's book of life. We have to be very careful I take a great risk standing up here speaking loudly like this.
We have these truths. We have these words of God to guide us. If it produces a constitution, great. If it produces a nation of people that live in freedom, great. But I don't put my faith in those things. Those are just the products of the righteousness of God. Do you realize that? You realize that? Like the freedoms in our country, the freedoms of the Constitution and our nation, those are products of following this word. They're not the foundation. God's word is the foundation. God's word is the guide. God's word is eternal. There was a young man that was struggling with the idea of the symbols of this nation. And he was speaking to an older, wiser soldier. I'll make a long story short. He's, he basically asked him, he says, he says, why do you fight for this flag? This flag is just an old rag. It's just a symbol. And the older gentleman says, I fight for the flag because that flag symbolizes the people. It symbolizes the people. It says, I fight for America, not because America's so great, because the people that live there, some of them are my family. Some of them are my friends. And I give my life for the strangers too. We have to be careful worshiping symbols. We need to remember what the symbol stands for. That's the important thing. Don't throw away the symbol because the symbol's not the thing. That's, that's not what I'm saying. Some people might interpret it that way. Oh, well, you just want to get rid of the flag. No, no, I don't want to get rid of the flag. I want people to realize what it actually stands for and quit worshiping the flag itself and serve the people that it stands for. It's just like this communion. I don't worship that cracker. I don't worship that grape juice. I worship the Lord Jesus Christ, his body and his blood for whom they stand for. Do this in remembrance of me, he said. That when you do this, you're remembering me. That it's a person behind the symbol. Why do you think the Constitution has phrases like, we the people? It's because the people are what's important. It's the people. I'm sorry, I'll, I could rant like this for a while now, you know. But you don't need my opinions and my rantings and ravings. We need the word of God to guide us. Let me continue here, and I'll finish up. Just a few more verses. It says there, in verse 13, evil men and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue, continue in what you've learned and have been convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. Listen, listen carefully. Continue in what you've learned and, ha and have been convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it. Who's he referring to? In chapter one, you don't have to turn there, but I, I recommend you study it out when you get a chance. In chapter one, Paul mentions to Timothy, he says, I remember the faith that was in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I am convinced lives in you as well. Paul testified that Timothy came from a family that knew the scriptures, that were righteous, that followed God, and they, that he learned from his grandmother Lois, that he learned from his mother Eunice. They were Jew women. They were Hebrews. They knew the law of God, and they taught it to him. He says, from infancy you've known the holy scriptures. From infancy, since you were a baby, your mother's been reading the Bible to you. 
From infancy, you've known the holy scriptures which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, some of us have been brought up in households where we had godly mothers, godly grandmothers, godly fathers, godly grandfathers who taught us the scriptures since we were a kid, brought us to church, got us in front of teachers that would teach the scriptures. But there are a lot of us. There are a lot of us that weren't raised in a home like that. So there are some of us that would read this thing about Timothy and we can't relate. Some of us didn't have a grandma reading the Bible to us. Some of us didn't have a mother praying over us. But I want you to think for a moment, have you ever in your life known someone, had a relationship with someone who lived a good life and told you about God? Listen, listen to what he says to him. He says, continue on what you've learned and have been com- become convinced of because you know those from whom you learned them. Is there anything that you've learned in your life that you learned from somebody and you knew that they really believed it because their life showed it to you? That's what he's talking about. He says, you know who you learned it from. He says, continue in this thing that you've learned because you know the people that you learned it from. Your grandmother Lois, Timothy, you know she was a godly woman. Your mother Eunice, you knew she was a godly woman. So since you know what kind of life they live, you can trust what they taught you. He's speaking to example. And we can learn from this. Even if we weren't raised in a house like this, now, now we can change things. It was so important to Paul to bring it up to Timothy. Think about it. He used the ink and the paper. I want to remind you that there are people you know that prove, that prove what they teach. They walk the walk. They walk the talk. They don't just tell you good things, but they live good things. You can trust that. And he tells them, continue in it. These good things that you've learned, these holy scriptures you've been taught, continue in it. Continue in it. Listen to this. They're able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed. All scripture is inspired by God. All scripture is given by inspiration of God. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. Listen to this. This is the Amplified. It says, every scripture is God-breathed, given by his inspiration, and profitable for instruction, for reproof, and conviction of sin, for correction of error, and discipline in obedience, and for training in righteousness, in holy living, in conformity to God's will, in thought, purpose, and action. Ooh, that covers it all. That covers it all. And listen to this, verse 17. So that the man of God may be thoroughly furnished, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Paul uses these absolute words for a purpose. He says, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Thoroughly equipped means that you have all the equipment, all the gifts, all the tools, everything you need. Thoroughly equipped. Not partially, not almost, but thoroughly. Through and through. Everything you need, thoroughly equipped. And then he says, for every good work. Not some, not half. Every good work. In other words, God's word, scripture, is sufficient. It is enough to give you everything you need to do everything you need to do. That's a bold statement. God's word is enough to give you everything you need to do everything you need to do. This is a big endorsement by the Apostle Paul on Scripture. Immediately, our minds 
Our minds want to track away from that. I'm going to tell you, like, everything that you need for everything you're going to do is in this book. Many people are like, but what about food? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Well, what about clothes? What about a house? Consider the lilies of the field. They don't reap, they don't toil, they don't spin, yet your father clothes them. And Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed, was not clothed as finely as these flowers. We always want to make a but. Well, I know the word of God has, that God gave me everything in it, but I, I, I need to do this. I need to do that. I need. Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water whose leaves don't wither, bears its fruit in its season, and everything he does shall prosper. Through God's word, he's given you everything you need. Paul says it a different way. Actually, Peter says it in a different way. Peter says that through his divine promises... Through his divine promises, God has given us all that we need to live a godly life. Through his divine promises, God has given you all that you need to live a godly life. And if you obey his word, you'll be established in your thoughts and your actions. If you obey his word, follow him. Obey Jesus in his command to love. Obey Jesus in his command to pray. Obey Jesus in his command to serve and wash other people's feet. Now, you might not literally have to watch some, wash somebody's bunions, okay? And it's, it might just be you need to humble yourself and do for others. God's word is enough it's enough. Now, if this word produces a constitution, good. Good. If this word produces godly children in your household, woo, good. Thank the Lord. If this word produces a dream and a vision for your life, for you to do something important, good. Good. If this word produces in you a desire to serve, good, good. But don't place your faith in any of those things. Believe the word that produced it. Believe in God who gave it. One of the biggest troubles we have is misplaced faith. We have a lot of things, and so we trust in the things instead of the God who gave them. I said it before, I think it's worth repeating. I love this, I love this. When you pray, sometimes your prayers aren't good and the reason is you're so preoccupied with your needs. You're focusing on what you need when you pray. That's why your prayers are dry and you don't like to pray. It's because you're focusing on your needs. But if you pray and begin to focus on God, it'll turn into worship. Praise, singing praise. Some of y'all, you can't lift your hands. You can't praise God with a happy heart. Your, pra your praise, your singing, there's no joy in it because you're so preoccupied with praising God for all your blessings. Thank you, God, for this, and thank you, God, for that. But if you become preoccupied and focused on the Lord when you're praising, that praise will turn into worship. Worship is when you're drawn into the presence of God and he fills you, empowers you, and blesses you truly. And you will walk out of that worship truly filled to overflowing, truly ready to be a blessing. It starts here in this word. The wise man is the one who hears these words and obeys them. 
It's the foolish man that hears these words and walks away and forgets them. The word in prayer. The word in prayer. I promise, last thing. What's the key to relationships? You've been told this all your life. Key to relationships? Communication. Communication. God's word is him talking to you. Prayer is you talking to him. The key to relationship is communication. I really believe God's going to do some things. I really believe that God is going to continue the work that he's been doing since the dawn of time, that even now he's doing in this very room, that God is not done yet. You remember how at the end of the movies, you know, if you ever watch those movies where there was multiple parts at the very end, something surprising would happen and then it would flash across the screen to be continued. God's not done. The half has not been told. Jesus came, we know that. But the scriptures declare he's coming again. He's coming again. And for all those who look for him, glory and honor at his appearing. He shall raise us up out of this dead world to live life eternally with him. That is our hope. That is our joy. To be continued, church. Don't forget what Paul said. You continue in the things you've learned and been assured of, knowing from who you learned it. If you learned it from God, and you're convinced of it, continue in it. Continue in it, amen? Will you stand with me for a word of prayer? Thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, God, for your hope and your strength. Father, I pray that right now, Lord, please, Give me a blessing of mercy. If I've said anything that's not from you and that is not true, let that stuff be forgotten and fall to the ground. But I pray, Lord, and I thank you, and I'm so glad that your truth will stand firm. And if I've spoke truth, you'll back it up. Lord, you watch over your word to perform it and accomplish it. Let the lies be forgotten. Let my silly personality be forgotten. Strip all that away in the minds of your people and let them be left with your pure word. Let them look to the scriptures, look to the Bible for sustenance, for strength, for their food. I pray, Lord, that today this would be an encouragement for our people to seek the truth of the scripture. That's what you told Timothy through Paul that even though the world and the church was getting worse around us and we're seeing so many bad things in the world, what we're supposed to focus on is continuing in the word, continuing in obeying it, continuing in living in it. Lord, I thank you for this word. Because right now, Lord, your people are struggling. We're hearing so much evil happening in the world around us and you want us to remember what your word says, to shut out some of those voices and, and to quit listening to the news and just listen to the good news of the gospel. Give us strength in this time. And Lord, I know that it's not all terrible. Lord, I know that you want revival in your church. Send a revival, Lord. Bring the people in. Give us the courage to invite them. I want to see souls get saved, Lord. Give us the strength. Give us the power to do it. Give us the power to do your work. Lord, there are many of us here. We don't want anything big. We're not asking for huge things. We just, we have a family member that doesn't know you, Lord. Help us. Some of us, we might have a child. We might have a cousin that doesn't know you, Lord. Help us. Please save these souls. We give ourselves to you. If, if you want to use us to do it, if you want to use us to speak the word, if you want to use us to pray or whatever, Lord, please open our hearts and minds so we know what we need to do. Help us to see clearly the next step that you want us to take. Give us light. Give us 
You're not done yet. <laughs> You're not done yet. I'm so thankful that I can pray with you. Church, I'm so thankful I can pray with you. Right now, if you're struggling, if you're dealing with some things in your life and indecision, maybe, we want to be able to pray with you. If you've got burdens on your heart that you need to, to let out, I, I invite you to come this morning as we sing. If you need to get baptized, you've never been baptized in water, the water's ready. Scriptures declare, make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Peter said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus. There's a command in Scripture to be baptized. If you haven't been baptized, let's get it done today. If you need to get baptized, I invite you to come. If you've never surrendered your life fully in obedience to him, I invite you to come. Maybe you need something and don't know what it is. I invite you to come. Let's talk about this I don't know and let's bring it before the one who knows all things and let's see if he can give us an answer. If you've got a need that you wanna deal with right now, you need to get some things straight. Come forward as we sing.